I think we all know Sanctic for being that one dumb Roblox Area 51 game that refuses to die. I mean, it's been around for 7 years and is still up with no signs of going down. We've seen the killers, the locations, the guns, the... whatever that is, good god my eyes, but have we ever thought of Sanctic having an actual story? actual lore to the game. And I know, that sounds insane. This is a game about killing killers in Area 51 with Call of Duty weapons while you use a hookshot from Legend of Zelda to get around. Yeah, that's where the hookshot is from, by the way, you're welcome. But I mean, look at Piggy. It's a Roblox game where you're the only human to exist while you run away from an animal with a baseball bat trying to knock you out. For reasons. And it has a story to it. Quite a large and expansive one, I might add. I think if Piggy can have an entire storyline, I don't think it's too far-fetched to think that Sactic has at least some remnants of lore behind it. The main problem with the Sactic lore though is that it's not explicitly told to us throughout the game. We just kind of have to use clues and details that are written down to decipher the timeline. And I'm about 75% sure Sactic wasn't built with an initial storyline, so of course there are going to be some questions that don't have proper answers, which of course I'll be pointing out as I go through this video. But how do we even start by dissecting the Sactic lore? Where do we even begin? Well, I think it's most appropriate that we start by clarifying what Area 51 is in the first place. If we don't know why it was built, then we can't theorise or talk about anything. Would be a boring video. Now I'm in no way trying to compare the real Area 51 location to Sactic's Area 51, but they do share some similarities. As some of you probably know, the real Area 51 located in Nevada is believed to be a location to test new military weapons and technology. This also appears to line up with Sactic's Area 51, having fictional weapons like the ray gun and freeze ray present. But that's not all. We also know that our version of Area 51 holds movie serial killers and creepy pastors that are used as grunts, workers, and security. As noted by the leader in Area 51 Storming, referring to the killers as slaves made to kill intruders. Damn, that's harsh, leader. Can't you just call them guards or something? But anyway, it explains why the killers are there in the first place. To firstly hold them all in one area, but also to have them act as security. I mean, what better way to guard your top secret military base than classics like Jeff the Killer? And Smile Dog. And who could forget Slender Man? Hmm, yeah, maybe you should stick to soldiers, guys. It's not yet known why the killers willingly help the soldiers. I mean, if I was a bloodthirsty monster taken from the woods, I want to get my revenge on my captures as soon as possible. But all that really matters is that the killers are now soldier safe approved, at least during the time of storming. Speaking of storming, let's talk about this game mode in particular, as it's going to be very important when we dissect the lore later down the timeline. I think it's pretty obvious that storming is the first mode that occurs in the Sactic story, or at least from the events of the game so far. How do we know? Well, there's a lot of evidence to support this. Firstly, certain rooms don't exist in storming while also being in other modes. Also, the fact that soldiers are still roaming the area, teaming up with the killers. Like we mentioned earlier, in other modes, the soldiers can only be found on the surface, implying that the killers and them had a falling out of sorts, and no longer have control over the base. Speaking of, it doesn't really make sense for the killers to suddenly team up with the soldiers later down the timeline. I mean, it doesn't really make sense for them to team up in the first place, but whatever. Now that we have a base for the beginning of the timeline, let's do the opposite and talk about the believer last point in the Sactic story. Endless survival. I think it's pretty apparent where the events of Endless start in terms of the timeline. Right at the end, hence the name, kind of a dead giveaway. I briefly mentioned this in my iceberg video I made a while back, but it's often theorised that Endless Survival is some kind of nightmare or dream, hence why the perks and power-ups conveniently exist and also Wave 666. If this isn't heck, I don't know what is. There's no way Endless Survival occurs before any other mode in the timeline. I mean, it is Endless Suffering after all. Well. Round 99999 is technically the last round, but technically endless from a law standpoint, yes. Now I'm not going to go into the whole argument on whether endless is some kind of nightmare or actual reality, the most important thing is that it occurs last. All of the rooms from previous entries like the Tailstorm and Wendigo's area exist, and only the barricades and traps appear in this mode, meaning they had to have been created around the endless survival time period. Oh, and I'm also going to mention this later as well, but yes, I am aware that the vents that appear in Classic and Killer Mode don't appear in Endless, but I kind of see this as a gameplay mechanic to make the game, well, not too easy. You could just camp in the, the vents the entire time. What's the point of Endless in the first place? Now that we have at least some guidelines for the beginning and end of the timeline, let's move on to Classic Mode, probably the biggest part of the Sactic lore and where we could dump the most stuff in the story. 
Now I think we can technically order all of the classic modes plus killer mode into this category, mainly because they all have the exact same rooms and vents present in all of them. Remember what we said, a lack of rooms means it occurs earlier in the story. I'm not really sure what type of classic mode comes first, but it doesn't really matter for now. We'll just slap them all in the middle and call it a day, since we know that storming is the definite first in the timeline and endless must come last. There isn't really too much we can go off of here. Boss Rush is up next and is honestly quite easy to rank. In fact, I'll show you right now. Classic and Boss Rush actually occur around the same time period. Now that sounds insane. How can we go from killing killers in Area 51 to fighting bosses in an instant? What's the evidence? Well, the fact that the Kraken, the first enemy you fight in Boss Rush, is actually in Classic mode. You see, in the sewers near where the op spawns, there's a blocked off white coloured door that you can't open. And what area do you start in before fighting Kraken? An area that looks very similar to the sewers with a blocked off white door. Now in reality, there's nothing actually behind these doors other than a void more desolate than the end dimension, but canonically, I think there's a pretty good chance that these two link up. As for the other boss, Aberration, I'm not 100% sure where her door comes from. Perhaps it connects to the Wendigo area locked door in the basement, or perhaps it's from a location we've never seen before. However, I think it's quite unlikely that these bosses occur at different points in the timeline. They are in the same mode. We'll go with Kill House next. Now, this one has less evidence going for it than Boss Rush, but still enough to place it on the timeline. Now, we actually know that Kill House is a room in Area 51 where the soldiers train. Why, you might ask? Well, it's clearly not on the surface and has several Area 51 doors connecting to it. I couldn't really find any door in Area 51 supposedly leading to the Kill House, but I think there's a pretty good chance that it comes before Classic Mode. Mostly because there is a soldier in Classic Mode who does mention the Kill House's existence. But why can't it occur before storming, you might ask? Well, just look at the Kill House targets. Notice the images plastered on them? That's right. If Kill House occurred before storming, these targets would have killers on them. Remember, at this point in the timeline, the killers and soldiers are like best buddies. There's no reason the soldiers would randomly set up targets that have killer images on them and not kill the killers afterwards. However, this also means that somewhere before Kill House and after storming, there must have been some sort of point where the killers began a revolution over their soldier captures. Why else would the soldiers not appear underground in any of the other modes? We'll just mark this point on the timeline for now, just so we don't forget. Huh. Killers turning against their soldier captures? I wonder who could have seen that coming? We've never actually seen this event before in the game, heck it hasn't even been mentioned in Sactic, but it had to have happened at one point. And with that, we have one mode left to rank, and I've saved the hardest for last. Juggernaut mode. You know, Juggernaut is my favourite mode in the entire game, but from a lore perspective I hate it because it messes up everything. The problem is, there really isn't anything written down in Juggernaut that can hint to where it could be on the timeline. The only clues that we really have is its differences to other modes. That's it. The main thing that sets Juggernaut apart from the other modes is only having one killer. But where did all the others go? Did they die off? Get killed themselves? This is probably the only mode in Sanctic where I'm going to have to guess entirely where it fits on the timeline. But wait! There are two more pieces of evidence that set Juggernaut apart from the other modes, those being the teleporters and lack of soldiers. Ever wondered why teleporters exist in Juggernaut? To make the game playable! Well, I mean, you don't want to see Smile, Dog and Rake climbing up ladders, do you? That would be very cursed indeed. Remember what I said at the beginning of this video? Area 51 is all about testing new weapons and technologies. What if one of those new technologies were teleporters? Soldiers wouldn't waste time getting from place to place, would they? I know if I owned a military base, I'd want my workers to be able to get around the area as fast as possible. It's practically a no-brainer. So am I saying that Juggernaut comes after classic mode? Well, yes, but there's one last oddity to go over. If you have the opportunity to look around the surface on Juggernaut mode with less than three players present in the lobby, you may notice that it's a bit empty. Yeah, that's right. Not a single soldier is left. Huh. So where did they all go? Last time I checked, the soldiers in Sacta couldn't be equipped with the Curse of Vanishing enchantment. That wasn't funny. Why would the soldiers disappear from Juggernaut and then reappear in Classic? Doesn't seem to make much sense if you ask me. I'll put Juggernaut mode between Classic mode and Endless mode, at least for now. However, despite all the game modes now being in believed canonical order, there's still one massive key fact we haven't mentioned thus far. What role does the player have in the story? How do you fit in? 
Well, at first I thought you were playing as the same person, but I mean, how can you go from raiding Area 51 in Storming to allying with the soldiers in Classic Mode? No, we're definitely playing as multiple people here. In Storming, you're obviously raiding Area 51, but in the rest of the modes, I believe you're actually playing as a soldier. Why? Because one, the soldier captain says so, duh, and two, the regular soldiers don't attack you like they did in Storming. I mean, yeah, you might not look like a soldier, but how quickly do you think the game would die if everyone looked the same? Yeah, it would reach zero players overnight. And also, it doesn't really matter what you look like in-game, you all play the same character. Alright, so before I go mentally insane and become a FNAF theorist, let's go over our timeline that I've established thus far. First is Storming Mode, a time where an individual known as the leader leads a group of raiders to raid Area 51 and frees the aliens from their prison. Pretty self-explanatory. After the leader leaves Area 51 with the captured aliens, there was a somewhat falling out with the killers and the soldiers. We don't know why or how the killers suddenly became so aggressive, but it must have happened at one point. To get better at their target practice, I assume, because the soldiers literally stand still and storming for god's sakes, they create the kill house, to prepare the remaining survivors for the coming battle with the killers. They send the last soldiers down to Area 51, probably to kill off the remaining killers and defeat the bosses of the area, which they eventually succeed in doing albeit with one super powerful killer left, the Juggernaut. We actually don't know whether the Juggernaut wins or not, as we're given no evidence on the outcome, but we can make a pretty good guess that the Juggernaut succeeded, as you are kind of dead and endless. But regardless, this leads us to Endless Survival, the heck or underworld of Sanctuk, a never-ending dream where you, the player, are haunted to forever fight the killers for all eternity, or at least until round 9999. And there you have it, the entire Sanctuk timeline explained by an idiot. But there's just one small problem. Okay, a big problem. I'm lying again, several big problems. This mainly stems from the killers respawning in classic and killer mode. I mean, yeah, in Endless the killers respawn too, but that can be explained pretty easily because Endless is just a dream, but classic and killer mode is just weird. All of the killers respawn for no reason or explanation, which opens up a lot of plot holes in the story thus far. Unless the killers are equipped with infinite totems of undying or they can clone themselves, this is a huge problem for the Sanctic law. Let me know what you think in the comments, hopefully this will get explained with a paper or two in the game one day. But there is one more thing I want to touch on before this video is over, just for something to think about, and that is the mystery of the Tales doll area. But why do I bring up this location in particular? It might be dangerous, very dangerous actually, but it has one of the largest and quite interesting lore implications we've ever seen in Sackduck. The Tales Doll area, well actually its official name is the Checkpoint area, has three different papers located around the various rooms, titled Diary Entry 1, Diary Entry 2, and The Robot's Invasion, or more specifically, papers 4, 5, and 6. Despite them obviously being numbered wrong, I'm going to read them out in believed canonical order, starting with Diary Entry 1. Great name by the way. Diary Entry 1. I started my new job today as an engineer for Area 51 in the Robotics Center. I have only been here for an hour, and my mind has already been blown by the technology here. Diary Entry 2. The team's goal is to create automated defense robots for the area. I am part of the manufacturing team, so it's my job to make sure the robots get put together correctly. The Robots Invasion. The rejects room always made me uneasy. The endless scratching and pounding on the door of the failed robots. I should have left as soon as I heard that. Now it's too late. The new batch of robots went rogue and killed everyone else. Everyone except me. I am hiding in here with them pounding on the door. I don't have any food. I am so hungry. Someone, please help. Well, nobody's gonna help you if just leave the note in the room with you, idiot. Aside from the obvious grammar errors, it's very likely that all three of these papers were written by the skeleton in the office room. I mean, the paper is literally right next to his corpse after all. So what does this tell us exactly? Well, from these three papers, we can explain that there were two sets of robots created for Area 51 security. One batch that worked fine and were friendly to the soldiers, and the other batch that malfunctioned and killed everyone else in the area for reasons. While some might be comparing these security robots to the actual killer robot, I might as well evaluate which typing he falls under. Robot's case file states that he's the last of the remaining active security force. Now the file doesn't specifically state which batch of robots he belongs to, but since we do see the robot at the end of Area 51 storming, I'm gonna say batch 1. 
But that still begs the question, why would Area 51 need a robot security force in the first place? They already have the killers. And even if the security force were successful on killing off all the employees, like the robot's invasion paper mentioned, why don't we see them around the area? This is also where Saktik stumped me again. But for the answer, let's take a look at the door leading you to the office room, where the robot's invasion paper is held. On rare occasions, I assume because of a texturing glitch, sometimes you can catch a glimpse of a claw mark left by what we can only assume to be from the robots the paper was mentioning. I don't know about you, but that doesn't look like a dent that Robot himself could make. No, that is very clearly a rake claw mark. So what does this mean for the Sactic lore, that Rake is somehow a robot? Well, let's take a look at another killer, Tails Doll, who actually appears in the Rejects room, a room where the paper state is used for the failed robots, which is odd for what we would assume to be a ghostly puppet killer. And before someone comments, but Ash, Tails Doll is a robot, I looked it up. And while that might be true, why would the Air 51 employees make a robot that looks like a fictional character? Wouldn't it be much better to make the robots, I don't know, look like actual robots? And surprisingly, Rake and Tails Doll are not the only killers who've left their imprint on the checkpoint area. The second skeleton, found at the very beginning of the location believed to be the guard, has a knife stuck in his back. Yeah, that is very clearly Pennywise's signature knife. But why Pennywise? Doesn't he, like, spawn miles away from this location? Unless he, the Rake, and Tails Doll were created here. So am I saying all the killers in Air 51 are robots? Well, not exactly. Clearly there are some exceptions to this rule. Zombie, alien, kraken, and aberration are clearly organic creatures, either explained through their case files or other pieces of evidence. But all of the other killers, what's stopping them from being robots? Well, let's dig a little deeper before we jump to conclusions. Firstly, let's go back to the rejects room. There are clearly the remains of rejected or scrap robots left here. I don't know about you, but don't those body shapes look super similar to that of the other killers, rather than the actual robot we all know in the game today? Secondly, the time period of Sactic. While we can't be sure of any dates written down in Sactic as a whole, I'm gonna guess from Storming to Endless, the time period is about 20 years. That would make Jeff the Killer pretty old, but what do you know, he, he hasn't aged a day, and there's, there's multiple of him. Hmm, I wonder why. It makes sense and fits with the timeline as a whole as well. In Storming, we very clearly kill killers like Freddy Krueger, Jeff, Scream, who don't respawn. But hey, what do you know, it's suddenly they're back in other modes, baby. And finally, it explains why the killers had a revolution against their soldier captures that we mentioned earlier. Their programming was clearly flawed somehow, so they got angry and started attacking humans. Notice the status die message near the Tails Doll area? Speaking of their programming, it even explains why the killers can't open doors. If these were rationally thinking killers with a brain, wouldn't they try opening the doors to the rejects instead of busting it down? It's a trend we've seen throughout the Sactic modes as a whole. Perhaps the buttons on the doors aren't built into the killer's programming. And before you go and assume that it's just an unintentional game mechanic, let me lead you to one of the papers found around Area 51, supposedly written by one of the soldier survivors. Paper 2, which lists a bunch of tips for players, reads as follows. Try to trap all the killers in a room where you know they won't go anymore. So either the soldiers are super big brain and have studied the killers, or they know that they can't open doors. Maybe I'm going insane. Maybe, maybe insane is an understatement, but hey, th this theory gets rejected. I don't know what to think anymore. And there you have it really, the Sactic storyline explained by an idiot with IQ going into the negatives. I know I did miss a few things like the elite bosses, uh, extreme classic mode lighting, the leader, the way out, the energy drink, the hook shot, the gun location. God, God, this timeline sucks. It doesn't, it doesn't explain anything at all. What was I thinking? But the goal of this video is not to solve the Sactic lore, mind you. The goal of this video is to show that any game can have any story at once, dark or not, big or small. And even if the Sactic storyline isn't this deep, or if it exists at all, it's been fun going over everything and flexing my knowledge of this game. But that's just a theory. A Sactic theory. I'll see myself out then.